Welcome to this episode of the Raising Capital podcast and YouTube show. I'm your host, James Tuckerman. Now, if you haven't done so yet, make sure that you hit that subscribe button so that you never miss an episode. And if you're listening to this on your phone or watching this on your phone, and if you have never given us a review, please take a moment to do just that. You'll be helping other people find this show and you'll be helping us more than you may ever know. Now, this episode is proudly brought to you by the B2B-Podcast Network. If you are a B2B business owner, B2B-.io helps you automate over 90% of the client journey via one suite platform. It's a funnel builder, a sales pipeline manager, and a CRM all in one. Use it to get more B2B clients and keep them forever. Now, today I have as my guest, Brody Haupt, and who is the CEO and co-founder of Australian digital lending and payments provider, Wealth, which is spelt W-L- TH. Now, he has a vast background in financial services, lending, fintech, and prop tech industries. He's developed new, numerous businesses in the finance sector, including money management, property lytics, and the exception wealth group. But call this, call, check out this. Brody is an alumnus of Oxford University. I don't know how to say this, Brody. I might have got this wrong, but the Syed Business School and the Harvard Business School. Now, if that's not cool enough, his business has raised a seed round of around three million, a Series A of around fifteen million, or perhaps he's working on that now. And he's done some other cool stuff as well too. Uh, some he's got some things in the pipeline, which we'll learn about in just a moment. Brody, how are you? Fan bloody tastic, mate. Fan bloody tastic. Friday that's, afternoon. That's really, really good. Now you're joining us from Queensland today. Yep. Did you grow up in Queensland? Yeah, born and bred in Brizzy. So um, yeah, I've, I've, I've lived here all my life. How did a how did a how did a Brizzy boy end up at Oxford University? And I said, you correct me if I get it wrong. Syed Business School and also Harvard Business School. How did that happen? Online learning. Ah, <laughs> well, that's all really cool. By the way, did I pronounce that right, Syed or Syed? Yeah, it's the Oxford um, University Syed Business School. Syed. Ah, it sounds yeah, very European, but not Anglo-European. It sounds very Germanic European. Yeah, sounds exotic. <laughs> it does sound exotic. <laughs> all right, so you have raised a couple different rounds. Were these specifically for wealth, W-A-L-T-H? Yeah, so we raised our seed round. Um, we kicked that off in March this year and closed out in June. And that was via a safe note. So security against future equity agreement, uh, which actually converts uh, shortly um, now that we've just opened our Series A raise for 15 mil. So literally opened that on Monday. Um, so you probably can see the dark dark rings under my eyes mate uh, we're <laughs> well into the uh, start of the road show and um you know information memorandum prep and pitch decks and presentations and data rooms and yeah all the above it's a fun time i stumbled on that when i was running through my notes because i'm like oh hang on this is actually a cap raise that's happening right now it's not just happened but uh let's talk about that three mil so you're actually the second person that i've spoken to in the last week or two that went to went down the safe route uh, yep. Tell us a little bit about that particular mechanism for raising capital. Yeah, it was just something that we found really worked for us and aligned with what we were trying to achieve. So um, we're a little bit different to say some of the other um, payment providers, fintechs, and you know, in that neo bank or, or banking sector, where you know generally they'll they'll raising or you know, in, in sort of a twenty four or thirty six months previ previous you know huge amounts of capital prior to, to launching. And we'd launched um, our first product, which is Wealth Lend, so digital lending, mortgage lending into the market in January. And you know, before we had runs on the board, um, we'd done a founder round where three of the four founders had invested another 1.44 million and topped up their shares at an eight mil vale. And we thought, well, we could go to a traditional seed raise now, but you know, technically we'll be giving away a hell of a lot of equity. And you know, why don't we try and sort of back ourselves to get it to the next level by the series A to a sort of significant valuation 
whereby we can convert. So it's still a really good opportunity for a safe note holder. So they had a 30% discount um, off the Series A valuation, pre-money valuation. So they get you know, quite a large discount compared to the Series A safe note holders and a lot of uplift straight after, straight after they convert their shares. Um, but for us, it just came down to the point that we didn't have to give you know, a huge amount of equity piece away just to try and get um, you know, a few million to, to keep the growth trajectory going. So let's go right back to the beginning. Let's talk about the business that, you're, that you've been raising money for, that you are actively raising money for now. Um, in a, in a, what's, what's the elevator pitch or indeed what's the, the narrative that you've been delivering when you speak to investors? What's the story? What's the big idea? Yeah, so for us, we're trying to build a lending and payments fintech that serves business owners and helps them bridge the gap between their personal and business financial needs. So that started with um, property secured mortgage lending. So we offer resi, commercial, retail, all property secured lending at the moment. Um, and then we've just started launching out our SME lending products as well. So if you think lending and credit on one side, and then the second component of that is in the payment sphere. So back when we first had the ideation for wealth, we thought that we may enter into the, the restricted ADI or neobank challenger bank space. We quickly understood how capital intensive it was to deliver, I suppose, a payment product to market, but also then have the regulatory restrictions and the capital intensive restrictions that come along with it. So we thought, let's rethink the model. Let's work out how we can get high revenue generating products to market then fulfill our product suite ecosystem before the need for a full banking license. So it's still on our roadmap. It just keeps pushing out further and further based on us wanting to bring forward products into the roadmap or, or, or that ecosystem. So I've kind of covered lending. Uh, there'll be other products that come into the lending stable soon, but in terms of uh, payments, it's, it's kicking off with payments for business. So the, the trigger for, for the series A raise right now is part of a corporate merger. So, We've actually um, been working with a business which is based out of Melbourne, uh, which is a, a B2B payments platform that has a few different um, brands in market. I can't say the name of the business until we finalize the Series A raise. So investors are allowed to know, but the public perception can't know at this point in time, unfortunately. Um, and that's just purely down to the, uh, the clauses in the, uh, the purchase agreement. Um, however, that business gives us the ability to inorganically grow our product roadmap and deliver what we're trying to achieve as a business today. So I'll give you a use case. Our next product that we'll be launching is called Wealth Pay. We're currently in pilot test um, mode at the moment and it'll be launching in February. And what that gives a business owner the ability to do is to make payments out. So you've got a payment gateway, which is also on our roadmap, which will be called Wealth Payway, which is accepting payments as a business. And then we wanted to create a payment uh, platform where we could get payments out as a business owner. So use case would be, as an example, you would onboard yourself into Wealth Pay, you would sign up, you would then integrate whatever your accounting platform of choice would be. So either Zero or MYOB. Um, then you can pull down all of your invoices that you need to pay, all of your staff, PAYG that you need to pay, um, any tax bills that you need to pay, any services, general expenses that you need to pay go through that process. So it's like a, a batch payment facility at that point, um, which saves time as they are the bookkeeper, CFO, business owner. Um, once you get out to the fifth step, which is um, processing that payment, it gives you choice. So the Merge Co partner that we've, we've purchased, they've got the ability under their platform at the moment, and we do in the pilot, pilot program for wealth pay, the ability for us to pay any type of those payments, invoices, general expenses, PAYG tax, via credit card on each of the major card schemes. So that's Visa, MasterCard or Amex. So with that, most people then also have the ability to link or have a loyalty-based card that they may be using. So majority of the platform that's put through that, that Merge Co partner at the moment is through Amex. So they'll receive Amex points. So it's kind of a further benefit to that business owner, but we will also give you points on top of that as well. So at the moment, they, they're linked and integrated directly in with Velocity and also Qantas Business Rewards. So um, is it about the platform in a sense that it makes all these different steps much easier for the business owner? Or is it, and there's extra benefits, like they get like rewards points and things like that. Or is it more like a, a payment facility where people can look at how much money you're owed and look at your invoices so that you can free up 
cash that might not yet be in the bank. So is it a, is it a, a tool to help the business go faster and smoother or is it a tool to help with short-term cash flow issues? All of the above. All so of the above, right. I'll, 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 cover that, I'll cover that first point and try and dissect everything they said then. So um, as I was saying before, um, they can generate loyalty points as well. So we have the option for the business owner to either link their velocity uh, points program or their Qantas business rewards program directly uh, to the platform. So they're effectively getting double the amount of points because they'd be getting their Amex scheme points plus Qantas business rewards points as an example. Um, so come back to your question. Yes, it saves them time in terms of loading up um, payments into sort of a batch payment facility, a payment facilitation platform, but also then they can earn loyalty off the back of it. So they're getting rewarded for utilizing our platform. And then we want to give them other options of managing their cash flow pressures and issues. So the first component to that is you can pay via a, you know, a visa debit or a pre prepaid card, or you can utilize your credit card to pay business expenses. So that's kind of the first use case. Secondary to that, we're wanting to build in a, a tool and a product called Wealth BMPL for Business, which while they get to the consumer com, um, checkout component, they effectively say, okay, which card do you want to pay your invoices? Say, you know, B2B Dash.io has got $100,000 worth of invoices and expenses he needs to pay for this week. Checks his Amex balance. Oh crap, I've only got $40,000 of available credit. No problem. Put $40,000 on your Amex, max that out this week because you know that you've got, you know, some, some big amounts of revenue coming in the door. Um, I'll put $60,000 on a payment plan, on an installment plan through the Wealth BMPL business product. Uh, and pay that off over four weeks, eight weeks, or 12 weeks, as an example. Yeah. What that will do for business is increase that relationship in terms of the speed between payables and receivables. So with your suppliers, you'll have better relationships because you'll be able to pay them faster. Now, it's not you know something that you can continually keep doing and just keep racking up a heap of, of uh, installment debt as a business, but we understand intrinsically the issues of, of cash flow with a business. It's mm. up and down like a heart rate monitor. It's never particularly you know, if you're flat, like, beautiful line. Particularly if you're all logged into the zero account and the MYOB account, but Brody dropped an acronym before and it just sort of like stumbled, you know, it came out of his mouth and that was a uh, B N uh, P L. And the acronym stands for buy now, pay later. So if you've heard of like, you know, zip pay and after pay and after money, or I don't know, all, all these different things, it's, it's, it's a different model. And yes, it is a model that is so hot right now in the, uh, in the fintech space. So uh, I can see why you would be adding that to the model because it's great for the business owner. Uh, it's a great business to have. So the client's happy, you're happy. And also in the context of raising capital, I imagine that it also would be a, 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 a useful way to grab the attention of investors right now because it is an area that is so hot. Now, how long has this idea been in per percolation for? How long were you in the you know, research stage and the dev stage before you and your business partners decide to, to really throw something out there and cough up some cash and make this real? Yeah, so it was almost like an organic pathway to to delivering wealth if i'm being completely honest which is quite strange to to think of in this space so traditionally um, myself and my brother who's also a co-founder of wealth started a property advisory firm uh, just on nine years ago now which is still operating today in such wealth group um, from there we also then launched into the finance brokerage space inception finance and we've got um, a business that we've inherited and purchased through that business called Bayside Home Loans as well. So there's two operational finance brokerages with about $1.5 billion on its trail book. We've also then dabbled in the tech side of things. So we actually have an active um, personal finance manager app in market called Money Management, as you referenced at the start of the show. And then also a property projections and calculations tool for residential and retail investors called Propolytics. And that effectively helps you understand your after tax cash flow, but also be able to um, comfortably and confidently project out uh, the returns of your investment on, on residential property as well. So we've always been in and around that finance sphere and sector and definitely have a skew on tech. Um, the reason why we originally built those first products was purely you know, born out of frustration of not being able to find anything in market. So we thought, 
you know what the hell was it let's let's build build it ourselves so we've never been scared to take on a challenge um in 2017 uh, i believe we we met our business partner in wealth um an english expat who's based over in uh dubai darren hodgkin was actually at the uh, abu dhabi f1 which was kind of like my pseudo bucks after i loped which was quite <laughs> funny that's a story for another day I really liked uh, what he stood for um, in terms of his business operation and the way that he'd been operating. So um, he's been in the e-com space, um, website um, development, branding, software development, um, and has one of the largest media brands in the UAE. Um, he's actually just successfully launched a Shopify competitor actually in the, in the UAE region mm. uh, called Commerce, KMMRCE which they've just raised 177 million and $1.4 billion val. So wow. brings a wealth of experience to us. And at that point in time, he was saying, look, I've, I've been trying to crack into the market in sort of the challenger bank space in the UAE, but it's more about, you know, who, you know, what, not, not what, you know. Um, and we said, well, we're actually thinking about creating a, a challenger lender uh, in the Australian market. And we would like to also build out that product, bre product breadth and create an ecosystem, which would help support business owners um in their whole sort of financial life cycle and he said well, it's well, interesting look, it's, it's actually interesting because you, it's you and your brother right and you're doing yeah. your thing and you're both identifying spaces now when we're talking about this topic of, of raising capital you meet someone at uh at a sporting event there's a like-minded conversation but this is even before you'd begun to raise capital but here is someone who would logically come on as an as an initial investor slash co-founder so you were you were you thinking that at the at the beginning this this could be a, an easier a shorter way to do it or was it just a meeting of minds it, purely that just a meeting of minds just meeting like-minded people that had you know kind of a similar a more advanced in 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 terms of the maturity of his business operations but um a very similar sort of mindset around um, building businesses and brands and not being afraid to have, you know, I suppose your hands in different areas and sectors and, and have a crack. And that's probably what spoke to us about that. You know, naturally, um, as that progresses, you realize, okay, well, this be, would be a good person to go in business with because they have capital behind them and it takes a lot of the pressure off. Um, but myself and my brother have always self-funded um, every startup, every business that we've ever had. So we've not really been scared of, of creating or, or taking that first step. It's not mm. like we've had to leave a full-time job and take the plunge as they call it and, you know, have the chat with the wife and say, look, I'm about to go <laughs> join startup land and, and we're not going to be able to afford much for the next six months. Um, it's been a bit of a different, different sort of evolution, but as I said, it's been almost organic um, and it, it might sound cliche and, and a bit cheesy. Um, but, you know, I feel like even you alluded to the, to the tertiary studies I've done, so I did the Oxford FinTech program around that same sort of time as we met Darren. And, you know, that was very much focused on the neobank space in the European and UK markets. And I did my thesis on the ASIC sandbox license here, um, which, you know, personally, I didn't think was, was worth too much to, to sort of any incumbent players. And following on from that, um, also did the, the Harvard Business School Sustainable Business Strategies. And, you know, through throughout the course of business, myself and Drew have always really wanted to have a, and create a business that has a strong skew on purpose. And we've been able to achieve that with wealth. Yeah, cool. Um, so you mentioned, so we, we, I'm gonna go back to the, uh, the 3 million seed uh, and uh, the safe mechanism that you use, that was really cool. But you mentioned that uh, there was about 1.2 or 1.8 that originally came in from the founders. Was that, 1.44, yeah. 1.4? I got it. I got halfway between there. I said 1.2, 1.8. So 1.4. Yeah. And that was between you and uh and your and your two co-founders. That's um, yeah, obviously so to get it started, four. but you ended up raising three million. Was was mm -hmm. was that the intent? We're putting together the mechanisms, we're probably gonna need three million. If we put in one four, we're demonstrating that we've got a bit of skin in the game. How did that all play out? Yeah, so how it kind of worked was um, the original 144 um, that we put in as founders. So uh, we had four founders, uh, have four founders, sorry, to begin with. So the other one is John Kerr, who is a, a global payments 
um, savant basically. So he's been in the industry for sort of circa 35 years and worked with the largest sort of processes globally and launched card programs all around the world. And we were leaning on him for, I suppose, his knowledge and nous. Um, he just wasn't in a position to provide capital into the organization. And we were introduced to him from Darren. So at that point in time, he took a wage for the first 12 months. Uh, myself, Drew and Darren obviously said, look, we'll, we'll in, input the capital that, that needs to happen. Um, and then once we injected up to the 1.44, we said, look, let's redistribute shares based on our, um, our capital input. And then, you know, very much early on in the piece, we always knew that we wanted to have sort of a hyper growth strategy with wealth. We didn't want to launch a product into market, you know, generate revenue, generate profit before you start growing like we'd done traditionally. So it was quite new for us. Um, and we did a lot of cash flow modeling, a lot of projection modeling uh, to work out what we would need to get us through to this next step um, of, of raising a, a Series A. Um, but we always had the mindset too to make sure that we had some inorganic moves um, in the M&A space to coincide with further and subsequent raises. Yeah, cool. Which makes sense as well too. Uh, every investor loves a story and an M&A, uh, some sort of acquisition is a great story. Um, it, everybody gets it. The, the difference between 1.44 and 3 is a little less than 1.6. Where did that 1.6, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, top of the class. Um, where did that money come from? Um, so funnily enough, inside the safe, the three mil that we raised for the safe, myself and Drew actually tipped in another 1.2 million ourselves um, just because we want to be involved in the subsequent rounds and, you know, we're gaining further confidence um, in our vision and our ability to deliver upon that vision as well. So there was another 1.8 inside the, uh, the safe note, which was from um, a mix of obviously family and friends, um, but probably the most, um, I suppose, encouraging and, and enthusing component of, of the people that sit on the cap table inside that safe note uh, is our exec team. So I think four, four of the exec team actually invested personally at that point in time. Uh, and then we also have a mix of from strategic investors. Um, two of them are individuals, which either work for a VC firm or a PE firm. And the idea was to get them on early. So then when we got to our series A, they could then take that back to their representative firms um, yeah. to try and get them onto the cap table at this point in time as well. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a good mix. It's interesting uh, listening to lots of different stories. Uh, and there are some people that have gone down the crowdfunding path. And for their business model, it made complete sense. You know, like if it's a bottled beer or something like that and everybody wants to own part of a brewery. But then the other path is to make sure that the earlier investors are people that can find other people to go the next round. And they bring on investors that can make introductions to the people that can move it on to the next round. Um, when did you open up the the, the Series A? And, I, and I've got to say, you know, how, how's it going? So we actually opened it on Monday officially um, on the 22nd of That's November. That's right. You said that. But mind you, you yeah. said you opened it on Monday. That doesn't mean that you haven't spent the last three months speaking to people about the Series A. Yeah, no, we, 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 yeah, we did speak to people earlier. It was probably two weeks um, prior to opening. And as I said before, the trigger for that was uh, the execution of the, the purchase agreement with the Merge Co partner. So that probably dragged on another two to three weeks longer than we'd anticipated. And that's really just down to, uh, you know, trying to wrangle, uh, you know, two, two teams of lawyers from both sides of, of the <laughs> fence. Um, but the cap, the cap uh, raise journey so far has been super positive. I know that might sound cliche, but uh, for us, it's, you know, it's, it's been, um, I suppose, exciting uh, to see the response of people. And first of all, they get and understand the concept of what we're trying to achieve. Um, but you do come back to the strategic investors. So it's funny that you mentioned that because over the last sort of seven to eight days, um, particularly when you speak with the likes of family offices, um, they definitely want to see a cornerstone or a lead investor um, on board. And it's almost like you, you tell us when you've got that cornerstone locked in and then we'll come right on their coattails because, you know, effectively they've done all the research. So it's, I mean, it's smart by them, but it's just quite a funny yeah. dynamic to be like, uh, we don't really want to do the research. You tell us when, when a top VC or a, or a top PE come on and we'll just come in behind them and happy days. 
And it's so, funny because um, yeah, it's, it's real it's chicken and egg too. Because you're like going, well, you yep. could be the lead. If you were the yep. lead, everyone else would follow. Yeah. Like, Let's wait till someone else becomes the lead. And we'll see how we go. Yeah. How are you yeah, going no, about opening funny. doors and connecting with all these different people? You got a strategy behind that? Yep. Yeah, we're, we're quite lucky. We've got our, um, our head of capital, Tim Wilson, uh, on board. So he used to run uh, the old Blue Sky Investments. And um, one was one of the found, founders there. Um, and he's been working, you know, with with other sort of uh, startups and and tech companies over the last sort of 12 to 24 months uh, with their cap raise journey as well. Um, so, you know, he's got a huge network uh, and is fantastic to work with. So, you know, he's he, we're really blessed to have to have him in our corner. Um, but apart from that, it really just comes down to you know relationships and, you know, opening up your networks, you know, your staff, your team, if they know of anyone. Um, uh, we've really had a lot of people that reached out to us post the seed raise actually, uh, and just said, look, keep us informed as, as, and when you open your series A and, and let us know. So we shot out an email, you know, first thing on Monday, as soon as we'd, we'd opened the raise officially um, to all of our existing safe note holders and also to the merge codes, existing safe note holders telling them that they can have the opportunity to reinvest first. Uh, and then we've got a few strategic parties that we're looking to get on. Um, as well as, you know, hoping that we can land that sort of cornerstone investor in this round as well. I feel like it's kind of a sliding doors moment because as you would know, you know, there's different mandates with different VCs um, or PEs or family offices where they want this much chunk of the pie for this size. And if it doesn't fit that mandate, well, they effectively, you know, shut up shop then. So we're in a really nice position for some, some real cornerstone investors that, you know, we're really excited by. Um, but yeah, it's definitely almost chicken and egg and, and, um, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a long dance, <laughs> a, lo a long dance, man, that if you it ever is. put together an autobiography, that's what you could call it. <laughs> what, what, do you, what do you, what do you think? What do you think has been, um, the hardest bit? I often say, what was the bit that you thought was easy and it turned out to be hard or did you just expect it all to be hard? It was hard. What's been the hardest bit? To be honest right now, just cause it's so fresh, um, is, getting your documentation sorted for the raise. So um, I'm known to be a bit of a control freak and a bit of a perfectionist, but for good measure. So, you know, we're really protective of the brand that we've created and, you know, we want that to permeate from, from the documents that we put together. So the information memorandum and, you know, the, the amount of revisions and the amount of content and editing and adapting and evolving that, you know, it's completely different to the, to the, to the safe note seed round raise mm. um, because the business has evolved so much so then you're trying to pull documentation from here and images and renders and screenshots and um, it's full on it's hard and it's and it's understandably so that it's going to be different because the first raise the seed raise as they say it's the three f's the family friends and very special people uh, but however there's a lot of trust so you you know you probably mm. pulled together a slide deck and a whole bunch of other stuff that went with it but the, then at the end of the day, people were backing you because they knew you. Yep. And then you had the, you know, the safe agreement to legit, to formalize it the whole bit, just to um, logistics. I always love the logistical stuff because people, when they're doing these things, they always, always obsess to obsess about the little things. The first, the first raise, and I may have got it wrong. I think I got it wrong because I think that you put in 1.4, with your partners and then you raise 3 million after that of which yes. you put in yeah. 1.8 um 1.2 1.2 there we'll you get go there. we'll get there well, yeah we'll get there so did you um uh yeah the, the logistics of it did you have a big slide deck and a big pitch deck and did you put together like a mini um im yeah so for the first raise we put together probably the most comprehensive um, seed raise deck known to man. It was about 120 <laughs> pages. How many pages? Um, 120. 120. Um, I know, way over the top. Um, <laughs> but we were trying to show this huge vision that we had, right? So, um, you know, it, it was really a tool, probably more so for us selfishly yeah. when you think about it, because it was like our chance to brain dump and then have a full alignment across every single team and share it within your team. So then everyone's like, okay, I totally get, you know, where we're heading with this and what we're trying to achieve. So it almost had like a, you know, a double uh, purpose from that perspective. 
Um, but as you would know, when you're raising money and you're in the meetings with you know potential investors, very rarely do you go through your full IM or your full pitch deck. It's usually a presentation of slides. So yeah. we've taken what we learned from that seed raise and um, definitely adapted a different way of going about it. So for this this raise, we sent out uh, sent out a five page flyer, which was just you know um, title page, um, quickly talking about the merger, the merger opportunity, who the team is, and then you know sort of dates for the raise and. If you're interested, then let us know and book in a time for us to either do a webinar um, with a group of people for different times. So we've got a webinar on tomorrow and Saturday uh, for two hours, which I'll just present and then just fill questions. And then we've also booked in individual meetings through the course of that as well. In those um, meetings, the one-on-one -on -one ones, we'll have a effectively a pitch deck, like you said, which is a presentation of sort of the top 15 to 20 pages, um, which we're adapting and evolving through the process, right? So where even that 15 to 20 pages come from the start of this week to Friday is like, you know, worlds apart because you realize what you need to speak to, what's important to include. And um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's probably the biggest thing that we learned from the first one is you don't have to have everything perfect right on the front end. You can sort of evolve it as, as you progress the meetings with the potential investors. And I've just noticed a really popular thing lately is like, you know, you have your, well, it's 120 pages, then you have your 30 pages, then you have your five pages, and then you have the one pager. And then you have the five dot points that go in the email. And uh, <laughs> but there's this famous Mark Tw Twain quote. And he said, I didn't have time to write you a short letter. So I wrote you a long letter instead. And, uh, and that's the way it begins. It begins at 120 down to 30, down to five, down to exactly. one, down to five dot points, at which point they go, I get it based on those five dot points. But you could have never begun with those five dot points. It's never going to work. Exactly. You got to work backwards. So what is your big, I mean, like hairy audacious goal for this, uh, for this thing? Uh, when you're raising money, you're selling something that's yet to be. Where do you want to take this thing? Yep. Um, from a business standpoint, um, you, know, the, you know, one of our taglines, I'll share it with you, is you know, the vision is clear, the possibilities are endless. Um, now, that sounds like we don't have a clear direction and we also don't know what possibilities could be. Uh, but we really, first of all, want to proof of concept this in the Australian market and then also launch into to other territories, probably more the Westminster region, uh, the Westminster style um, finance system. So I'm talking mm. you know, North America, so the US, Canada, Europe, UK, Singapore, um, South Africa and the UAE, obviously with the connections with our co-founder. Um, we're really lucky by the platform um, infrastructure that we'll now have uh, from the payment side of the business from the Merge Co partner because it really is an agnostic platform that can be picked up and taken to other territories quite easily. And the compliance can be run from Australia if you know the regulatory environment allows it. So, so for us, you know, we're really trying to push in the next 12 months to be, become a really strong household name um, in the finance and, and banking sector of the Australian market in mortgage lending and also in serving businesses with payment facilitation. And that really starts from, as I kind of alluded to before, our, our purpose-led initiative. So we've partnered with a uh, recycled ocean plastic company called Parlay for the Oceans. So I'm not sure if you're aware of them. No. Um, they supply Adidas with all their recycled ocean plastic and all their shoes now. Oh. And they also work with the likes of Corona. Um, you know, they're, they're revolutionizing um, ocean plastic and turning it into the new luxury. And we've partnered with them. And the first kind of symbol to that partnership is um, we've created a Visa Recycled Ocean Plastic Parlay card, which will be launched in Q1 of 2022, which will be linked to our mortgage offset accounts. So I'll have full payment facilitation and an app to go with it. Um, that's a symbol of, of what we're trying to generate. So for every loan that settles within wealth currently, we actually clean up 50 square meters of Australian coastline or beaches and we actually just came back a month ago from uh for the great barrier reef uh where we did uh, an ocean exploration to watch coral spawning uh and remove you know discarded fish nets off the great barrier reef and clean up around with sunday island as well which was pretty phenomenal and eye-opening um so we're trying to create that you know deeper level impact as an organization and also then also be the conduit for other businesses to create impact as well so within our payments platform we will let businesses um, be able to either you know, 
basically tick a box and say a little bit's going to go to here give money yeah exactly and create impact themselves and then on the back of that we're also partnered with sale gp so we just signed off on a sponsorship with them for the next two seasons so that's like f formula one for sailing Um, okay and that's just because you want to well that's that it was it was kind of really a, a unique partnership i can't claim this one it was actually my brother's um genius with this one but um it's it's like formula one for sailing right so the the sydney legs on the 17th of 18th of december coming up the last leg was in cadiz uh, in spain it's all countries so there's 10 countries that competed at the moment they're all exactly the same boat exactly the same design exactly the same engineering team australia is actually winning the series and they won last year so we're a sponsor of the team australia boat but what we did with the sponsorship that drew sort of you know ideated with them was rather than us just giving you a set amount of money why don't we incentivize the Team Australia team to create impact based on how they perform throughout the season? So if they get first in any race, we clean up, you know, 1,500 square metres, if it's second, 500 square metres, if it's third, 300 square metres. So it's tied to, to uh, yeah. an impact initiative. And they actually have a thing called the Impact League in Sale GP, which means every race meet, they, one of the teams get awarded the Impact League trophy, which got... So you got a lot of things going on, Brody. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> I want to understand how your team works because, I mean, I, I've yeah. noticed this a lot actually with the uh, different people that I've spoken with. We've got, uh, particularly in this series, we've got everybody knows where they want to get to. I was speaking to Superhero the other day, for example. They're a trading platform, a bit like you in the yep. sense that you've got a whole lot of regular le- regulatory hoops you've got to be able to jump through before you can go to several levels. So they started with an ambition to get to here, uh, one step, then they focused on the one or two products that they could service right now. Then they add an extra product, then they get regulatory approval to move to another product and then, and then they move on. But it must get very complicated. So you've got, there's you, your brother, your business partner. You mentioned that there's a fourth player who was, who's, who's been playing a fairly significant managerial role. How do you all split up the responsibilities? What's the team look like here? Yeah, so we've got, so our other two co-founders are, are more step back and, and act in that kind of shareholder, um, non-exec capacity. Uh, and then we've got a team of 38 down in Australia and that's spread between Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne uh, in those regions. We were really, really fortunate um, Last year, I suppose, you know, the silver lining of COVID was we were able to kind of poach a few yeah, of our exec team talent. and build a really, really solid yeah, talent pool, but definitely at our exec level, which is so important. And it's about, you know, hiring people that have been there, done that, got the T-shirt. So, you know, as an example, our chief operations officer, Dave Curry, was the COO of a neobank called Hay. Um, our chief product officer, Joanne Chung, she was working um for myob setting up their business payments platform so you know we grabbed her over we've got kind of the the wise old head and in terms of our chief risk officer chris bromhead who's ex cba uh westpac um you know it's been all over the world working for all the major sort of banks and, and superannuation uh, companies as well um you know it's got some great people in our marketing pr teams um our national head of lending um great guy as well has got a heap of experience used to run the REA uh, loan channel over there as well. So it's just about having a good group of people, but you know, getting them to buy into our why as an organization and making sure that everything is at the core of our business is understanding what we're trying to achieve and making sure that our culture is at the forefront of keeping everyone happy, right? If we're all gonna to work toward this one common goal, everyone needs to be along and boarding into to that journey. Yeah, I don't know if you've read Good to Great, Jim Collins. Great book. But there's a bit where he talks about a, a concept called the hedgehog. And you've got to get the best people on the bus. That's one of, his, uh, one of his principles. But everybody needs to be passionate about what it is that they're doing. And the idea is that the companies that did go from good to great uh, usually had made a decision that they were going to be the best at, in the world at something. And everybody was on that yep. page. Have you got some sort of vision like that? Where do you want to be the best in the world at? And by the way, I don't mean to put you on the spot because it is a bloody tough question. Uh, but is that something that you play around with? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, 
for us, it's about, you know, we've got a heap of different mantras and, and, and vision statements that we utilize um, throughout the business. But for us, it's about, you know, expecting excellence. Um, that's something that we we're always trying to bring through for our team. Like we want high performers um, to be here and we want people that want to, you know, be on a high performing team. Um, you know, we have global aspirations in terms of what we're trying to achieve as a business. But I think where we've really sort of kind of struck gold is in this core purpose element and getting everyone to buy into that concept and learn about something which is so foreign to our industry normally, um, but we're having a real positive impact on um, not only our team, but our customers, our consumers, and then, you know, the byproduct of that is creating real, real and tangible and measurable impact um, with what we're doing with the oceans, with our parlay initiative. What, how do you spend your time? Well, what's the, I mean, like, what's the expectation of you selling, recruiting, raising, all of the above? How's Brody yeah, spend his time? I mean, a lot of it is is um, meetings. As I said, we've got a really good exec team, which you know we've given them you know, complete, total um, trust and and transparency to do their thing, do their role, manage their team via our reporting line. So, you know, once a day we have a, a strategy meeting um, with all of our execs, which we just jump on half an hour to an hour, all check in with each other, see if there's anything that's being roadblocked we need to to solve. Um, and then the rest of it at the moment, obviously, is, is, is meeting with the investors and the like. But when we're not in cap raise mode, um, it's, purely, it's purely just about supporting our team, um, you know, making sure that we're, we're staying on target and I suppose holding our feet to the fire uh, when we're looking at you know, our projections uh, and our KPIs that we're, we're trying to hit. Um, with the investors that you're bringing on, do you think that they're looking at the income that you're generating right now and they're looking for you to get to a place to profitability or they're looking at your income and your progress that you're making right now as as proof that you've got what it takes and worthy of another round acknowledging that it might be a few more years until you hit a place of profitability and by the way i'm assuming that you're not profitable but i might be wrong but just, is it what what's what's the feedback that you're getting from these investors even just by facial expressions. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a mix. I mean, you know, you've got your generic terms you know, around how they would value a business in your sector. Uh, and there's no allusions to that, right? Like there's significant um, amount of data and benchmarking that has to be done for them to validate your valuation as a, as a first sort of step. But um, I ultimately think that, you know, you hit the nail on the head. They're buying you, they're buying your team, they're buying your passion, they're, they're buying into the concept of what you're trying to achieve as a business just as much as they're, they're buying into the financials. Um, and if they can see that you've, you know, you've got the passion, you've, you've got some runs on the board in, in terms of previous ventures, um, then that can hold just as much weight, um, if not more sometimes than, than the financials. But uh, you know that there's different nuances to every meeting and every different type of investor that you're speaking to so you know one thing that we're really excited about if we can land a PE firm that we're we're speaking to at the moment which we're really really hopeful um, that they'll come on board is that they'll be you know really strategic they'll take a board seat they'll be hands-on um, they've got a really complementary set of investors within their own uh, investment pool uh, which is something that excites me so we've almost handpicked them and then been introduced to them off the back of, we feel that they would be the best fit for our business. Uh, and we're not probably naive enough to just take a check at this point in time. So, you know, if, if, if we were speaking to a VC and they're being really hard enough trying to smash us on the veil, put all these different controls into our shareholders agreements and, and the like, um, we'd have no qualms saying no to that. Uh, and we actually went through a, a situation like that in the safe note. We had a, an overseas investor who wanted to drop five million, but put all these controls, have a lot of say over where our direction was, change the, the vision for the business. And we had to just kind of pull the rug out from underneath them and say, you know what, so be it. You know, we've, we'll, we'll, we'll raise the funds elsewhere. Um, we'll do what we need to do because we're not going to give that way, away that type of control so early on in the piece um, and have, you know, this vision changed. 
I would like to know more about how that conversation went down with your other co-founders. There's someone that wants to drop in 5 million, but however. Yep. Yeah. I mean, it was, you have to have tough conversations. That's just the, the nature of, of business and being a business leader. So we won't always agree. I suppose the, the positive that we've got in terms of our business and a dynamic of working with your brother is ultimately blood stick in the water. So, you know, we can have an argument five minutes later, you forget about it, bridge on, you know, water under the bridge and, and you move on. Um, and it's kind of, you know, delete it from your memory and, and start again. So we've always worked together. So we understand that dynamic for other um, co-founders. Sure, you have to have those difficult conversations, but Ideally, I think if you come at it from a, a position and an angle of respect to each other and you can have conversations, just lay out the pros and cons and make a group decision that we all kind of validate and are happy to stand by, um, then, you know, there's no issue with that. And it kind of was almost an empowering moment in our journey uh, when we were able to do that so early on in the piece. Um, and it pushes you to, you know, to problem solve and, you know, think creatively and, and, um, you know, not so in the box of just thinking, check, 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 money, money, money. We're good for another 12 months of runway because, you know, what's going to happen in two, three, four, five years time if you've taken on the wrong, wrong person into your business. That's a great point to wind up on because it is extremely empowering to turn around and say to someone, no, no, I don't want your money. No, I don't want to bring you on as a customer or client because you're staying true to your values. It opens up your mind to start thinking about how we're going to manage the constraints that we just created for ourselves by saying no. And then I have found from my own personal experience and also talking with others, then you and your business partners are so much stronger because you've done, you've worked through the trenches, you've been smashed by something, and then you've come out the other side so much stronger. Well, I'm really looking forward to hearing what happens with this series, A. Eh? I'm really looking forward to hearing what is this mysterious business that you're looking at acquiring. I'm really curious about who this PE firm is. So I look forward to sometime in the future, perhaps having you back on the podcast in the YouTube show once again. Thank you, Brody. I'd absolutely love to, mate. Thank you so much for having me on today. Good combo. Excellent. My pleasure.